Imagine this, a creative agency changing the way businesses tell their stories. Ten years ago, people were like, huh? And like, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that. But companies did not get it and they did not want to part with their budget. The highs and lows of being an entrepreneur. Does that mean that like, if my company has no value, do I have no value? Like that's ridiculous. Kia ora, I'm Jahan Kasanada and welcome to Imagine This, a podcast about brilliant people doing awesome stuff right here in Wellington. My guest today is the co-founder of creative agency Wrestler. His name is Ben Foreman. Hey Ben. Hello. I first met you about 10 years ago when you were flying drones around the city. What were you up to back then? Uh, I was trying to impress a girl. <laughs> um, I had just finished university thought I wanted to get into film, got into film for a couple of months, realized that film was full of ego and pomp and just not that fun. Uh, and so I, I, then I discovered it's really easy to start businesses. And so I registered like three <laughs> or four businesses in like a really short period. But one of them was a drone business. And this was before drones were a thing. Yeah. Um, and they were kind of like lawnmowers in the sky. They were terrifying. <laughs> and so I started this company, Sycamore. And uh, I was, yeah, I was trying to like impress this girl at the time who is now my wife. And we have two children together. So it worked out. Um, but I was like, oh, you should start this company with me. Like it's like drones and stuff. And she's like, well, that's cool. So we, we started it with some friends. I mean, it's a bit of a sad story. We spent $25,000 on this big old drone and we flew it like four times. It was like it, within six months, it was completely obsolete. It was just like a piece of trash. And now it sits in our studio as this kind of marker of the a reminder to not invest too early in early stage tech. Were you always interested in technology? Yeah. So my mum works in insurance. She's always worked in insurance. And back in the day, when your like phone or TV or whatever broke, you'd have to send it into the insurance company. Maybe that's still the case. But anyway, my mum like would come home with all these broken cell phones and like these broken bits of tech that I would use as toys. And I had this little briefcase that I would um, like run around in the backyard full of tech and I'll save the world sort of thing. Um, so I've always loved technology. Did you know what you would end up doing when you were in your teens? I wasn't great at school. I don't really learn that well in the, in the traditional schooling system. And so um, I did one of those career tests which said I would either become an exhaust fitter or a radio presenter. Wow. Which, which kind of like, I mean, that's a bit of a bit of a low blow for radio presenters to <laughs> bunch them in that camp. But also like exhaust fitter as a as a specialized craft. Like yeah. so that was a bit of a debuzz. So I didn't think I had many um I didn't have high aspirations. And I like growing up in Upper Hutt, I had not heard the word entrepreneur until I went to university. Like I didn't know that was a thing. Um and yeah, it wasn't until I moved out of home and kind of uh, got exposed to the world that I started to catch that bug of entrepreneurialism. And how did that happen? During university, I studied media and marketing and I um, I knew I loved filming things and making content because I had, you know, in high school, um, in the last few years, I'd made parody rap videos with my friend and all <laughs> these like ridiculous things, Lego movies and um and when I was in uh, university, I found media studies and marketing like pretty easy. And so I spent a lot of time um, making content. And uh, when when I left university, I thought, oh, I want to get into film. And so I went and worked on The Hobbit. And I was working as kind of like an assistant to the production team. And I would look after international cast and crew who would come over and they would need a PA for the you know, a couple of weeks over here. And one person I looked after was this guy, Jim Gennard, who was the founder of Oakley Sunglasses. He had sold that for two and a half billion and started Red Cameras. And um, The Hobbit was one of the first big features using his cameras. And so I looked after him for a couple of weeks and he instantly like 
cottoned on to the fact that I had this kind of entrepreneurial mindset, which I didn't even really realize. But he just gave me life advice for the whole time and we would drive around together and just he'd just be telling me his stories and like giving me all these words of wisdom. And then there was one uh, thing that he told me, I think on like the second to last day, which was that if you can believe 100% in what you want to achieve and learn to, learn to block out the false perceptions of even your closest friends and family, then you can achieve whatever you want. And that's what he had done in his life. So I, I was when I heard that, I was like, okay. And that's when I went off and met, registered like four different companies being like, well, I can believe it, I can do it. <laughs> and yeah, some of them some of them worked well and Wrestler's been the one that stood the test of time. So how did Wrestler start? Ah, oh, it actually started because I did a little internship for my uncle's magazine, which was Idealog. I don't know if you remember that. And I realized this was like, 10 years ago when YouTube was only five years old and it was mostly cat videos and just (laughs) ridiculous stuff. And I was like, oh, this is the future of communication. Like this is how businesses will talk to their customers. Through video content. Through video, online. And and how did you know that? It just was obvious. (laughs) Like it just seemed really obvious, you know? I guess because to me naturally that's my preferred state of media consumption, you know, or any consumption is through the visual medium. And so... To me, it was a no-brainer, and I literally have nothing to lose. I'm 21. I have nothing to my name. The like the worst case scenario is I have to move back to Upper Hutt and live with my parents, which was a bad scenario. <laughs> but that was, you know, like I had nothing to lose, so why not give it a go? So the idea was to create a company that helped to make video content for businesses. Yeah, that effectively helped tell your business story online effectively. And what was that like when it started? Well, this is what's crazy. 10 years ago, people were like, huh? And it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that. But companies did not get it and they did not want to part with their budget on like, and I was, this was like a thousand dollars for like a, you know, like a, pretty good video like I I was very good at what I did um, and I could make a little bit of money go quite far and but companies were still like nah not for us meanwhile they're spending like five hundred thousand dollars on a you know television commercial yeah and they were like mm, not for us and then so over the years I just had to like keep just slogging that but let's talk of- about that period so you're 21 years old you've got nothing to your name what are you doing? Are you cold calling people? Are you knocking on doors? What were those initial meetings like? Uh, to be honest, it's probably the same as what I'm doing now. I don't think I've ever changed, which is like, I just, when I see an opportunity, I just try and grab it straight away. And so like, I'll be driving along and I'll see a business that I think is cool and I'll just find their email address and I'll be like, and I'll just pitch an idea, you know? Do you still do that now? Oh, totally. I do that all the time. Wow. To me, Business success is it just comes down to one thing, which is resilience. Like, I get metaphorically punched in the face in the daily, you know, when I do reach out to people like that and then you don't hear back or they say no or you waste thousands of dollars creating a pitch and all sorts of stuff. Like, it's a, it's a brutal game, but you've just got to focus on the upside and the downside is just the, the cost to play, you know. Um, so you don't take it personally when you get those knockbacks? Not anymore. I used to. Uh, and then I went on a personal journey to try and, and I'm still on this journey, to try and disconnect my personal identity with the identity of the business. Tell me more about that. So for 10 years I was, you know, like as the business was getting more and more successful, my name was becoming more more successful and my association to the the success was becoming my identity and then it got to the point where I just had this realization one day I was like I've been exploring the world of wellness quite a lot in the last like three years um and one of the things I found really powerful for for me is breathwork meditation and I was doing one of these meditations and Breathwork meditation is, it's a strange thing. You breathe in a certain way. Um, it's quite simple, but you do it for about half an hour. It's very intense. And then you have this kind of after period where you just breathe normally and you just drop into this deep meditative state. And I was in that state and I just had this realization that like, it's really unhealthy 
to have my identity caught up in my business and my career because like a business is so fickle, you know, like something like COVID could come along and uh, it's completely out of my control. Could It could wipe it out. And does that mean that I'm wiped out? Does that mean that like if my company has no value, do I have no value? Like that's ridiculous. Like I'm so much more than a company, yet I was basing all of my identity in that. And So, so you thought like that for quite a long time? Yeah, yeah. And what was the impact of that thinking on your life? Well, I guess it's just limiting, you know? It's limiting and it's um, and it, it creates a much, you know, uh, stronger roller coaster because when you're riding those highs of a big win, then you feel great and you feel like you have purpose and meaning. And then when you have a big loss, you feel like you're useless and you don't, you know, have any value sort of thing. And, and that's so, exhausting. It's so exhausting. And so now I feel like a lot more equanimity of like I can ride through that and... I'm not as affected by it. It is the challenge, and this is where I'm still growing, is that not feeling those highs is kind of challenging to keep that motivation. Because when when you hit those highs as a business owner, that is a great motivator to go get that next high, you know? But if you're kind of standing back and going, you know what, like, it's cool that I've won this massive project, but it's it's not everything, you know? There's still other stuff around. Like, then you kind of you get a bit apathetic towards it. And so that's where I'm like struggling at the moment is to kind of like balance this um, awareness but still stay motivated. So you're trying to acknowledge those successes and enjoy those successes but not elevate yourself so much that your total well-being depends on whether you've won the job or lost the job. 100%. Yep. So you started this video content company. You got a bunch of rejections. How did you start to get real work? I always used to think that there was a silver bullet to business success and I literally Googled like, you know, silver bullet <laughs> growing a business. <laughs> like, I was like, there's something I don't know that people aren't telling me, you know. Um, but then I had this realization one day that it's just really simple. Like biz- business plans are kind of like, good while you're writing them, but no one ever kind of keeps looking back at a business plan. But to me, the best business plan is build the brand, do the work, tell the story. And it's a flywheel effect. And so if you just keep doing those things, they keep feeding each other and the flywheel builds momentum and grows and grows and builds and so grows. So build the brand, yeah. do the work, yeah. tell the story. Yeah. Storytelling is at the heart of what you do at Wrestler. Why are so many businesses afraid to tell their own story? I mean, I think a large part of it is kind of like the whole Kiwi uh, tall poppy thing of like, we don't know how to uh, talk about ourselves in a way that, without feeling like we're overshooting the mark, you know, like we're we're so scared of, of sounding... Um, I don't know. Pretentious. It, yeah, pretentious. Yeah, exactly. Or or exaggerating it that we just we just go, oh, no, we shouldn't, you know. Um, and even I definitely feel like we do that um, at Wrestler as well. Like we could be more bold about how we talk about ourselves, but I prefer to take that kind of low-key route because it's less – I guess it, you, you don't put yourself up as a potential to be shot down, you know. Like you're not – if you go out there and say like, we're amazing at this, we do that, blah, blah, blah there's a fear that somebody can go like, well, actually, you're not that amazing because of this. And then you're like, ugh. So it's, I mean, like everything, it's fear, right? So um, what do you try and do with your clients? What is the role that Wrestler plays? Uh, our role is to get to the essence of of who you are as an organization and find out what that human truth is that you're trying to, I guess, to sell to or to promote to or whatever. Um, because people don't want to hear just like about your product or your marketing taglines and stuff. They want they want to feel something. And so we're very intentional on who we work with. Like we, we work with brands who we feel are pushing the collective consciousness forward and are uh, offering something that can improve lives and communities. So we're not out there selling, you know, like candy to kids and stuff like that because 
it would be pretty hard to tell an authentic human story through that. And so, yeah, we choose brands that we feel are um, progressive. And then it, if we, if you choose brands that are really progressive, then it's really easy to tell the story because it's just about like taking what's already there and expanding that and amplifying that. What's it like working from Wellington? It's so easy to work in Wellington. You know, like we live like 12 minutes from work and our kids' daycare is on the way and right next door is Prefab and down the road is more Wilsons and like the the quality of life is so high and the ease of life is so high and that's why we haven't left. Like commercially there is more opportunity for us to, uh, if we were based in Auckland, but we started an office in Auckland to try and grab some of that market and shut it down after six months because we just, we didn't vibe with the culture there and the kind of pace and the kind of, I don't know, just the just the general vibe was not for us. Like we like the low keyness of Wellington. You've done campaigns for all birds that were shot in Wellington. Yeah, most of our campaigns are shot in Wellington um, and we just make them look like, well, we try and make them look ambiguous you know it's just a a global Mm. city um but yeah it's been cool and that's something that tim loves as well is to see his hometown like advertised globally you know for this massive brand and it's like oh that's like lampton key you know (laughs) it's quite cool so what's your advice to someone who has a great idea um i mean well have they validated that it's a great idea how do you do do they think it's a great idea how do you do that well, you have to validate it through talking to a bunch of people. Something I always do is like as soon as I kind of have start to have an idea about something, I just start bringing it into all my conversations and I just start to create a um, an understanding of what um, how people feel towards the concept. And then if it's something that I keep getting excited about, other people get excited about, and the conversations keep growing, then I know I'm onto a good thing. If the conversations are challenging, I find it challenging to kind of talk about and stuff, then it very quickly just dies and you let it you let it die. So there's always this kind of incubation period where you're not actually doing anything about it. You're just kind of exploring it, not just in your mind, but openly amongst friends and families and colleagues and whoever. Do you believe that everyone is creative? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think it's there's all sorts of different types of creativity though. Like uh, when I think about um, my brother and I, like we both are creative in the sense that we love to build things, but he loves to build things physically and he's amazing at it. I am beyond useless at like, I tried to build a fence once, I spent the whole day on it and then I literally touched it at the end of the day and it fell over. <laughs> like it was like comedy. Um but and he's not very good at digital stuff, you know. Like once, I had this really nice camera and I was taking great photos. This is when we were kids, and so he went out and bought the same camera to like take good photos. And he was like, "I think my camera's broken." And I'm like, "No, no, it's just you." <laughs> um, and so, like, yeah, we're both creative, but we both have very different strengths. And yeah, finding that can be a challenge. So, what is your advice to someone who wants to tap into their creative strengths? It's all about flow. And even I'm still learning this stuff. So uh, I had a a big revelation last week that um, I was overthinking everything. I I had a a realization that I needed to seek more flow in my life. Like I wasn't getting into flow state enough. And flow state, for those who don't know, is when you, you know, you completely kind of zone into what you're doing and the rest of the world kind of fades away time becomes irrelevant and you just really love what you're doing. And I used to get into that state all the time when I was on the tools creating stuff. But when you get to, you know, like business level sort of thing, it's pretty hard to get into that flow state. And so um, I was talking to my coach about this and he was he got me to run through a bunch of scenarios in which I got into flow state and then um, – he was like, what's the theme there? And the theme was building things and creating things. That's what I like to do. I like to start from nothing and create something. And then he was like, what's the why to that? And I thought for a while, and then he was sitting next to like this plant. And then I thought about like the plant 
and what is the why of the plant? And I was like, there is no why. The plant is just a plant. It just grows because it grows. That's what it does. And then I thought, I don't have a why and I don't need to have a why. And he was like, bingo, that's great. You don't need to. Um, So you don't have a why? No, and it was a massive relief because I was trying desperately to like contextualize my entire life and create, you know, all this existentialism sort of thing. Whereas like if I just seek flow in the daily and find look to find ways that I can get into flow state, that I can be creative and build things, then I will live a happy and abundant life. And I don't need more than that. What have you learned about running a business? That it is pretty lonely and difficult and that you need a lot of resilience. Have you had some hard moments? I don't really see them as hard moments, but learning opportunities. Like I had a, a hard a hard uh, moment this year when uh, COVID hit and then we'd also had like a big uh, growth spike and we had all these big international um, brands wanting to work with us and so revenue went up heaps, but then our systems weren't in place to deal with that. We were built for a smaller scale and so, because it all came at once, and then it was also at the same time that uh, we had our second child, profitability went the other direction. And it's like, cool, <laughs> like that's not what you want a business to be doing. And so, times like that can be really challenging because you feel like you're going backwards. But in actual fact, that was a real positive for the business because we redid all of our systems and rethought our whole model to build us for a bigger scale. And now we have the ability to scale um, in a way that is really profitable. The big lesson is that you can't skip the journey. Uh, I'm pretty impatient in terms of um, once I've got an idea, I want to bring it to life really quickly. And often that's led to a lot of frustration because things aren't happening fast enough. And, you know, when you compare yourself to other people, uh, you can feel like you're not doing as much as you as you should be and, and all that sort of thing. But everybody has their own pace and their own journey and you just have to give in to that and, and, and go on that ride, really. And if you try and fight it, that's where a lot of dissatisfaction and frustration comes from. Um, yeah, like if, you know, if I was to compare myself to Tim Brown and we've been running our businesses, you know, similar amounts of time. Tim's the founder of Allbirds. All Birds, yeah. Then that I would be, you know, feel quite bummed about that. But it's like he's gone on his journey, I've gone on my journey and that's like they're both equally as important as each other, you know. Are you proud of what you've achieved? Yeah, really proud. From a kid in Upper Hutt who didn't know what the word entrepreneur was and it was going to be an exhaust fitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've done pretty well. Yeah, I've done pretty well. What would you say to someone who feels like giving up on their business dream? Well, I'm also a believer in like that you can give up if you want to. You know, like I don't think people should slog out things if they're not happy. If it's just a little blip and you're struggling and, uh, you know, but there is light at the end of the tunnel and you can get back into that flow state and rebuild, then like resilience, as I said, resilience is the key to growing a business. You just have to be able to pick yourself back up. But if you've like picked yourself up like 10 times (laughs) and you keep getting smashed in the face, like don't be so proud that you have to keep going with that thing. Go like go try something else or go work for someone for a while and rebuild your energy and then try again in five to ten years. Like I definitely suffer from the the fear that my career is, you know, like almost up. I'm like 32 and I'm, I'm like, I haven't achieved enough. You know, <laughs> like I could start another three careers in my lifetime if I wanted. Um, and so... Yeah. Uh, where does that where does that come from though? That pressure to do more, be more. 
I mean, no, it comes from a not a great place. It comes from a place of needing to prove myself. Like I was, I was very small in high school, and I was kind of I I went from a private Christian school into a public school. I didn't have any friends, and I wasn't really that smart. Like I didn't have a lot going for me, you know, apart from being slightly funny. But my other friend was funnier than me. So the the thing that I had. I discovered after leaving high school was business now. And so that to me, again, this is where the identity thing comes into it. You know, like I um, recognized that I could do really well in that space and that's how I could kind of stand out. Um, And so that's, there's parts of that that are unhealthy where instead of enjoying the ride, I'm constantly looking to the future of like, how can I do more? How can I be more? How can I have more? You know, whereas the journey I'm on at the moment is trying to take a step back and go, actually it's, it's, it's about the journey. So you're learning to be more present. Yeah. More present. Yeah. But I don't want to entirely lose that hunger. That's what I was saying before. Like I don't want to become apathetic, you know? So it's like everything in life. It's all about balance, right? If I can find that balance of like being present and conscious and and have gratitude for where I'm at but then have that spark of uh of intrigue and curiosity and a little bit of hunger then to me that's a that feels like a really good place to be awesome Ben hey it's been great to talk to you thanks so much for your time sweet thanks man imagine this is brought to you by Wellington NZ Check out more episodes right here or wherever good podcasts are found. See you next time.